This is episode 106 of Off Script with Trish Close, intimate interviews with interesting people. Joining me today via Skype, I have Dr. Ilya Gorgoris, right? Did I say that right? 100% a fine Greek name, I may add. I was going to ask, where's Gorgoris? My guess was going to be Greek, but we can talk about that. You are the president of the Happiness Center, which just sounds like complete joy. We're going to talk about the Happiness Center. But you also co-authored a book called Seven Keys to Navigating a Crisis, A Practical Guide to Emotionally Dealing with Pandemics and Other Disasters. Holy cow, yeah. is that timely? And there's a story behind why it came out now, so I'll share that with you whenever you're ready. So. Okay. Well, I want to get back to Gorgoras. That's Greek. Uh, yep, 100%. I, I hear a little tiny bit of an accent. Or did you Were you born there? I was born there, and I, we, my family moved here to Santa Monica in Southern California, beautiful seaside, beautiful town in uh, outside of L.A. Uh, when I was 10 years old. So, uh, yes, I've been here a long time. You know, when you're young and you're, in, you're starting middle school, you want to assimilate. I had a strange name. I was a painfully shy young boy, so I wanted to assimilate with everybody else. So I tried to hide my uh, my accent. I I get to middle school, but get this, the girls loved my accent they're like talk to us more tell us more so i'm like don't be an idiot don't lose your accent keep it <laughs> yeah don't be an idiot you know um i'm from south carolina originally i moved to las vegas when i was 16 and i had this thick southern accent and i tried to do the same thing i tried to lose it because i wanted to fit in obviously and um I i'm very sad about that I'm glad. I'm so sad you lost your accent. I think Southern accents are beautiful. I've uh, I've spoken in South Carolina. I love your state. Well, um, trust me. Anytime I get on the phone with my mama, it comes right back out. So don't worry about that. Yeah. Uh, so mom and dad, where are they from, or where are you from in Greece? I was born and raised in Athens, but we have a home outside of. Uh, uh, Athens, about two hours on the Corinthian Gulf, right on the water, a, little, a place called Galax City. And this is, and I'm actually going there in less than a month. I just bought my tickets, and every summer I go back home and uh, swim, snorkel, you know, spend time with family, eat great Greek healthy food. Mm -hmm. As you know, the Mediterranean diet is the number one in the world. So, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. really reconnect with my roots. Our family goes back there 300 years. So, wow, I believe, aren't there parts of Greece? They're in those blue zones, right? It's the place where people are living the longest because they are just super yes. healthy. The Blue Zone is an island of Ikaria that's, uh, yeah, people live to be in their 90s and 100s, and they have a very healthy, uh, yeah, there are several Blue Zones around the globe, and Ikaria is one of them. So, and I, it's an island that I want to go and visit. I haven't been there before, but it's, I hear it's beautiful. Awesome. I'll put that on my list as well. What did mom and dad do in Athens? My mom was a mom. You know, back in the day, just raised my brother and I. My dad worked uh, as a Kind of a supervisor, I guess, would, would be the equivalent of the National Electric Company. That's, I guess, the equivalent of that. But they brought us to America. You know, they never finished college, and they want us to get a better education. Uh, my brother, both and I, have PhDs. Uh, he's a professor at Columbia in New York. He's a really smart one in the family, I'll tell you that. <laughs> my older brother. <laughs> and, uh, Was you know, that we were both... Go but, ahead. Uh, was that a big step for, I mean, obviously, I, I don't even want to, that's kind of a dumb question. I mean, huge step coming to America. Did they speak the language? Did they have jobs? Did they have, did they know anyone here? They did. My my dad's older brother first immigrated to uh, to America. He was the first one that attended UCLA, the first one that went to college. So both my brother and I are UCLA graduates. So UCLA Bruins thick and, you know, thin. Um, they had lived here before, and actually my older brother, believe it or not, was born in Hollywood, California. So they had lived here before for three or four years. They moved back to Greece. I was born there, and then eventually they made it back permanently. Um, and, uh, you know, they're both deceased, so they're both up in heaven, I believe, together. <laughs> Happy they were, uh, they were in love with one another, but my mom died tragically uh, from cancer when she was only 51. But uh, great lady, the, you know, best lady ever. She was beloved, beloved by men and women, respected, beloved, because she was all about happiness and love. So I feel like I carry her legacy in my heart in a lot of ways. You know, they call me the happiness doctor. I feel like I carry my mom inside me, you know, after all these years. She passed away 35 years ago, and she's still alive and well in my heart. What was, it, ab what was it about her that people respected so much? 
she was unconditional love for everybody. And she was joyful even when she had cancer and she fought it, which is another reason why we moved to America. The UCLA Medical Center at the time and still now is one of the best medical centers in the in the world. And because of the connections we had with UCLA, her treatment, I mean, it kept her alive for a lot more years. Had she stayed in Greece, I think she would have died when I was still a young boy. So she got to live, she got to actually see me graduate from UCLA, got to see my brother get his master's there. And her last kind of, and she went downhill right after our graduation. And she was like, this is what I've lived for. I know you guys are going to be just fine. And then kind of, you know, unfortunately, never got to see her grandkids. And, uh, but I know she's still up there somewhere looking looking over both my oh, brother I'm sure. and, I. and a huge sacrifice for your parents to bring bring you and your brother to the states yes i i feel like it's a huge because we had a really good life it wasn't like you know we were being chased that we had a very good life in greece but you know they just felt they wanted to expand our horizons and especially in, in academia so uh you know and, and that was pounded into us and the minimum was to get a college degree but then you know, my brother, older brother, set the example and went on to get a master's PhD, and I just followed, you know, after him. Different fields, of course, but uh, yeah, education is important. Is he older brother or younger brother? Older brother. Older. A little competitive, maybe? No, I'm the one that's competitive. <laughs> he's actually, my brother is a gem. He's like, and he's like world renowned. Like, he travels, he, he speaks, like, I, I'm serious, I'm following his footsteps. Like, he's spoken to China, India, Pakistan, I mean, Africa, like every, so I'm kind of following, I become an international keynote speaker, but just in the last year, I, last year I spoke in London and Paris, um, Rome and Athens, and I got more European cities to, uh, and hopefully India, because they've invited me to speak there in January. I'm kind of following his footsteps though, like he's way, <laughs> he's way up here. <laughs> so, so you... and he, and he was like the summa cum laude, right? 4.0, mm -hmm. scholarships coming out of his years. I kind of struggled in school. I'm surprised I even got a PhD. <laughs> I mean, school didn't come easy to me. <laughs> so you graduated from UCLA. Do you know you want to get your PhD at some point or how, how does that path work? You know, I didn't know right after that. As a matter of my first real job, so, so to pay for school, we didn't have a lot of money. I drove a taxi. I was a taxi driver in L.A. when I was 18, and I looked like I was 14. People would get in my cab and they're like, do you even have a driver's license? <laughs> I'm like, I know I look younger, but believe me, I'm 18 years old. I can drive. Anyway, I, I got a real estate license. I love real estate, but it was during the time where the interest rates were like 20%. It, it didn't really work. So, and I was afraid to be a psychologist. I thought, well, am I going to get depressed? If I hear people's problems morning, noon, and night, is this going to bring me down? So I, yeah, I was a little reluctant at first. But then I, I went on to school, got my PhD, started my own private practice as a clinical psychologist. Uh, and I did that. That was the first half of my career. Loved it. I did it for 18 years. The first 16, I loved it. The last two, I got burned out big time. How so? And I, it, it, no, I, like I physically... Be, because what I found out is the typical psychologist will last basically 10 years before they get burned out. Some of them even commit suicide. Like I did it for 18 years. And if they see 25 patients a week, that's considered full time. I used to see 45 people a week. I used to work like a maniac. People like, like you're crazy, you're gonna have a heart attack. I'm like, no, I can handle it. Well, I did up to a point up to, for 16 years. The last two years, I feel like I, it physically started affecting me all the stress, you know, basically carrying all the all, all the secrets like you, i can't tell anybody abuse you know all kinds of stuff rape uh, i mean the, the depression anxiety suicidal people you know and i wanted to make sure i got out of the practice without losing somebody because i was very concerned I, I don't know if i could live if one of my patients committed suicide we had some close calls but luckily nobody did and uh then i transitioned over to the corporate side and decided to do leadership training and develop and executive coaching so much easier and building strong teams. And then of course the book came out, Seven Paths to Lasting Happiness, that became number one on Amazon. And that really, the last four or five years became my business card. Like the book has opened up so many doors in, in, you know, for me, really worldwide. And then we come to this new book that came out, The Seven Keys Navigating a Crisis. So if you wanna hear the story as to how this book came about, I'll be glad to tell you. Yeah, I mean, I do have questions. I have questions about this um, business within clinical psychology is sure. and help me help me differentiate could you prescribe drugs as a psychologist 
No, psychiatrists can do that. There are, some, there are some states that actually, if you get a certificate in psychopharmacology, then you, you can do that. I don't know if it's, and I've been out of the business for like 15 years, so I don't know anymore. It, I had patients that said, I, I wish you could prescribe. Mm -hmm. And I had thought about it, but when, when that was coming, I was almost exiting the field and exiting my practice. So I, I didn't get a certificate in that. But in some states you can, yeah. But psychiatrists go to medical school, psychologists go and get a PhD. So it's MD versus PhD kind of. And so after all these years, you know, you're, you're hitting year 18 and you're seeing the decline within yourself these last two years. I'm always curious, when does that moment come for you where you go, enough's enough, and I'm done now. Because I think a lot of people, they're like, well, I'm doing really good at it. I might as well keep going. I'm making money. I'm successful. Exactly. I, I, I'm the doctor. I'm making you know really good money, and I'm successful. And I have all this, you know. But when your body begins to break down, at some point, you know, your physical pain brings you to your knees. So it, it literally brought me to my knees. And I'm a spiritual person, so I kind of like, you know, asked the big guy above. I'm like, hey. What's the deal? I'm, I'm helping everybody out. And I, I heard the voice as loud as I'm talking to you right now. Ilya, I'm trying to take you in a different direction and you're not listening to me. I, and it was very short, like this one statement. Guess what I did with that advice? I ignored it. <laughs> so guess what happens when you ignore? Now, some people can call it the spirit. Some people can call it your intuition or your inner wisdom. Whatever you call it, that voice was accurate and correct. So when you ignore it, does your life get better or worse, Trish? I'm going to guess worse. A lot worse. So fast forward six more months. Now I'm like, and I'm in like in and out the emergency. They're doing all kinds of tests, ultrasounds, this, that, and the other, inconclusive. Well, my pain was real. I wasn't like uh, psychosomatic. I was like in, and this would happen multiple times a week. So I'm exhausted. Um, again, after six months, now I'm really desperate. Back again, okay, why is this happening to me? I try to be a good husband, father, help them by community, you know, do all that stuff. And the message was, if you don't change your ways, I'm going to call you home by the time you're 50. I want you to spread the light to a lot more people, which is a very specific both warning and here's what your future holds. And because my mom died when she was 51, I and my dad died when I, you know, he was 65, I don't have that longevity for my own parents. So I knew that that message was a warning and I still had young kids at home. And I'm like, you know what? I know you were gonna, th you thought you were gonna do your private practice the rest of your life and be the doctor and so on. And it's hard to walk away from something that you've invested 10 years of education and all these years to practice and it's thriving. I mean, I had people on a waiting list. I mean, I had a full practice. I had to walk away to save my life. Hmm. And, and so I started, you know, taking no, first of all, it's not easy even legally to close down a practice. I have to hire an attorney. They have to guide you through it. There are steps you have to take so you don't get sued for abandoning people. Mm. It, you know, it's, it's not easy. It took me nine months to shut my practice down. Anyway, but unfortunately, my I, my body had been so depleted, I got sick. I started taking Fridays off, so kind of a self-care day, you know, no, no new referrals, just starting, you know, making sure that all my clients are taken care of. Well, I hit the wall, ended up spending six days and nights in the hospital, two surgeries, a close call, my body basically was shutting down because of stress. And and I and I asked the doctor afterwards, because you know, when you're all hooked up and you have six nights to yourself, you have a lot of thinking to do at night. A lot. And, and I'm like, this will never happen to me again. I need to learn the lesson right now, whatever this lesson is, this cannot happen to me. So after the second surgery, which my doctor came back and said we had complications after the first one. He tells me that after the second, I'm like, and I was on drugs. I think I was on morphine. I'm like, am I making this up? Or did, didn't he just tell me this yesterday? Like he had problems. <laughs> like, and it was true. I'm like, doc, I need to learn why this happened to me. He goes, two reasons, excessive drinking or excessive stress. And since I don't really drink alcohol, I knew that it was the stress. And I was in denial. I wasn't taking care of myself. I wasn't walking the talk. I was take, taking care of all these other people, but I wasn't taking care of me. Right, which is number and one, right? You have to take care of you first. That's number one. That's the number one step to happiness and to navigating a crisis. It's self-care. So uh, it took me like six months to physically recover, and I had to reevaluate my life and how. But the good news is I'm not even close to that. I've done it, what I'm doing now for 15 years. I will never get burned out. Amazing. Not even close. I'm actually more passionate and more energetic, and I'm 15 years older now, and I feel better. 
yeah. than I did before. Well, that moment when you said, okay, I'm done, I need to get on the path of making myself better, did you already feel a lot of stress just kind of leave you? No, because it was stressful to to exit. It, it's stressful not to know what am I going to do now. Like mm. like even financially, like like what will I do with the rest of my life? Right? I'm you know I'm 40 years old. Like what will I do now? I, it, so I had a midlife crisis. I, I think self inflicted in a lot of ways because the message was there. I could see that I was declining. I was just in denial. Hmm. Like I can do it. I can handle this. I can handle anything. Kind of very arrogant actually and dumb. I sort of said, you know, no, you can't handle it. You can't continue going at this space for 18 years and think that you're going to make it. Nobody, nobody can. So it was a, a humbling experience. It was a stressful time. And I had a dear friend who basically said to me, you know, Ilya, your skill set, he knew me as a psychologist, he goes, you would make a great executive coach. And I was so naive. I'm like, what's an executive coach? I mean, I, I've, I've been a baseball coach to my kids and a soccer coach. He goes, you know, executive coach for businesses. I had no idea what he was talking about. But he hired me at a first company. was a big company in the Northwest, actually. Hmm. Huge company. Uh, Puget Sound Energy. But pretty big. Very big. Very big. And I came in there and I started working with CEOs and the C-suite and uh, general counsel, like the, the, you know, top leadership. And I realized if you take away their titles and all the money that they're making, they're just people just like you and I, especially behind closed doors. So, I, so the executive coach to me comes very easy. First of all, there's nothing they're going to tell me that I hadn't heard before as a psychologist or even come close to being that stressful. That's true. So, right? I mean, <laughs> so, so that, was the, that was the transition. Okay. And so did you find happiness in this job, team building? Yeah, it, it's different. So I was used to making a difference one-on-one -on -one with people or in relationships, maybe a marriage or whatever, or family counseling. But now, when you look at organizations, and, and basically companies bring me in to change their culture. So I started talking about happy employees back before there were any Gallup studies or, or Harvard studies about happiness and what happy employees do. I was almost like a voice, I was kind of like ahead of, you could say ahead of the time. Now we have enough studies to validate all that stuff. And as you know, happy employees are more productive they're more innovative, they're more collaborative and better teammates, they're physically healthier, like they don't have time off because they, get, they don't get as sick, right? So there's greater retention, less turnover, and all those things affect the bottom line. Well, I was saying those things like years ago when that wasn't really, they, they thought that the happiness of, who is this guy based, talking about happiness at work? I pay you, just get to work. The beatings will continue until morale improves. <laughs> Well, it's different now. Yeah, So a lot different. Yeah. When did you start the Happiness Center? When did that come about? I, just as when I transitioned out of it. Um, and again, this was an inspiration. I, I didn't even know what a domain was back then. Like, I, I'm like technologically inept. The fact that you find me on Skype, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, so Coach Khan helped I, I, me with that one. Uh, yeah. I get people to do that stuff for me. All I want to do is come here and deliver the message. That's all, because that I'm really good at that. Technology, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> so Happiness Center, how did this this started? Because were you finding, um, well, first, before we get there, Happiness Center is an organization dedicated to helping others find personal success and happiness. Uh, you have helped thousands of people achieve happiness and fulfillment, both prof in professional and personal relationship. So with this, working with this corporation, were you finding that your messages were physically and emotionally and mentally changing people? Absolutely. Absolutely. And by the way, you know, I wrote both of these books from my heart, Trish. I, I didn't write them as a PhD. And when the first book came out and hit number one, people are like, you know, it's a it's a good book, you know. I, it, it, I can hear you even your accent when you're talking when you're writing. I can almost hear you talk like that. But they're like, Elia, it's not like you're saying something that hasn't been said before. And I'm like, I totally agree with you. I didn't say anything in this book that Aristotle didn't say 2,500 years ago. What is happiness? L love yourself, having an attitude of gratitude, forgiveness and self forgiveness, having passion and purpose, loving relationships. You know, feed your spirit, be kind to people. Basically, that's it. What's different, 
and if people go to Amazon and read the reviews, that's all I'm going to ask them. You know, I have like 60 reviews. It's like 97% positive reviews. It almost looks like fake news. Like I actually wrote them myself, <laughs> but it didn't. It, what people are saying is like, what we love about your book is at the end of every chapter, I have a couple of things for the reader to ponder and to meditate on, to think about deeply, a couple of questions for them to answer. And then the most important thing is what I call take action. In other words, it's more of a workbook. This is how you do it. So we all know that self-forgiveness is important. Most of us don't know how to do that, though. We know that self-love is necessary for one's happiness. We really don't know how to do that. So I spent, you know, my 30 years working with people. These exercises are, are vetted, and they, if you do them, you will be happier. Why this is important is because knowledge without application is just education. What does that mean? What it means is you can read the top 10 books, right, on happiness. And when you're, you can underline them and highlight them to death. And when you're done, where do they go? They go back in the bookshelf. So now you're more educated. You know more about happiness, but your life hasn't changed. And I think you're probably actually more frustrated because you know more. In life, and this is the biggest takeaway, if, if, if you take nothing else away from what I'm saying here to you today is this. It, what matters in life is not what you know. What matters is what you do with what you know. Mm. It's in the action that the transformation takes place. I and guess. my book is all about action. And so is the seven keys navigating a crisis. Like this is how you navigate a crisis successfully. Well, let's talk about that. How did this book start? You said there's a story behind it, the seven keys. The, the story is that on March 15th, beware the eyes of March, like you know Shakespeare said, March 15th, I had this very strong impression I needed to write a book. So I called my writing partner, Constantinos Apostolopoulos. Now, that's a fine Irish name, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Another fine Greek. My best friend and, and co-writer, we write together for Ariana Huffington's uh, Thrive Global and uh, the Huffington Post. So he and I have collaborated before. And I'm like, we need to get this book out and we need to get it out in 45 days. Not, ne not in November, not in 2021. We got to get it out now because people need it. And I said, brother, are you in or are you out? And he said, I'm in. And for 45 days, literally, we our goal was May 1st. On May 1st, the ebook came out, and I want to say May 10th, the uh, the soft cover book came out, the actual book. And it, it, to give you an idea how difficult that was, my first book took took me three years to write. So getting a book out in 45 days is almost impossible. But it was it, it was just meant to be. We're a great collaborative team. There's no ego. We're if he has a good idea, go with your idea. If I have a good idea, we do it. And we work well together. I'm a big picture person, and he's a details person. I hate details, and uh, so I'm grateful to him because I couldn't do it without him. And since that has come out, it, every day, there's a podcast, webinar, radio, or television interview every single day. And so I'm grateful to be on your show here today because the message is resonating with people. And the reason for that is because we're not facing one crisis. People think this, this book is about the pandemic. It's not about just the pandemic. We have the pandemic is crisis number one. Number two is the mental health crisis. In the United States, depression, anxiety, and stress-related symptomatology is up an astounding 800%. These are the statistics as of the end of May. We don't have the June statistics yet. Let me repeat that, 800%, not 80%. Suicide hotlines are at an all-time high, more phone calls than they ever received. Alcohol and drug abuse is way up. So that's that's issue and crisis number two is a mental health crisis. Number three, we have the economic and financial crisis as we have tens of millions of people unemployed in the United States, hundreds of millions across the world, and, and, and a couple of billion who are basically insecure about their finances or what tomorrow will bring because they don't really know, or they're underemployed. And then you add the social and racial strife on top of that. So now we have four crises are happening simultaneously. Now, as human beings, we're very resilient. We've handled crises before. We had 9-11, we've had other stuff. Usually we can handle one or two crises, not four at the same time. Right, right. And it, it, do you find too, they kind of feed into each other, right? So if you yeah, lose your job and... and you're broke, then that leads to your mental health crashing, and then that leads to this. I mean, there's just, they all feed into each other too. 
they're all connected and that's and, and that's the problem and the other thing is if whether the, it's the federal government or the state government or whatever, if they told us back in March that, you know what, this is going to end July 1st, we might look at this pandemic and go, you know what, man, July is such a long time away, but I think I can handle it. Mm -hmm. I think if we all pull together, if we were all, I think we can make it. We're now we're in July and there's no end in sight. People, and this is what's causing part of the, the stress and the anxiety and the depression is there's no end in sight. We don't know when this is going to end. Even if today, if they announce, you know what, October 31st, this ends. Halloween, it's over with. We go back to our normal lives again. We can say, man, I'm already exhausted by three or four months of this, but we got July, August, September, October. I think I can do it. The fact that we don't have a date and all the predictions have gone south. Remember, the early prediction were, well, just wait until the summer. It's going to get hot and right. with heat, this fire is going to go down. Not true. Okay, we're going to do some social distancing. We're going to shut things down. It's going to go away. Well, two days ago, we broke the record at 60,000 new positive cases in the United States, a new record. So we're going in the opposite direction. So we don't know when this is going to end. Now, I am an optimist by nature, and I'm, you know, I believe that I used to use the analogy that life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. I've had to make adjustments that this is an ultra marathon. Like it's not 26 miles, it could be 100 miles, because we don't know when this is going to end. Second wave in September or November when we get into the flu season. So we still have a ways to go. Now, having said that, I do believe that we'll have a vaccine early 2021, if not sooner. And their medications, they're already on the third trial, multiple uh, pharmaceutical companies. Right. So we're very close to getting the medication out. It, it probably happened, hopefully by the end of August, in about a 45 days or so, we'll have something out on the market, hopefully. Well, looking back to March, and I actually had um, a counselor on this podcast talking about this. I called it the, the COVID chaos because there's all of these things happening. And the biggest thing, especially for me, was uncertainty. Just as yes. you mentioned, there it's this major feeling of uncertainty. I would get home from work and I would just sort of be in this like daze. I would get depressed. And then the next day I would be like, no, I got this. I can do it. And it's this roller coaster of, emer of, of emotions. And a lot of people I talked to, especially those who were quarantined, so they had a hard time just getting out of bed, even though they were healthy and they were safe. Just all of these things coming at us all at once for, for people who, for the most part, have great mental health and who had a job and were going to work. You're, you're totally right. So let me share this. There's a big difference between danger and fear. If somebody comes up to you and I and they cough in our face, we're in danger. That's real. That's not pol pol political statement. That's a fact. That's a, that's a medical statement. Fear, on the other hand, is not our friend because fear is paralyzing and fear is debilitating. And we don't want to make major life decisions or even corporate decisions because I work with a lot of senior HR leaders now as companies are opening up again. Do not make decisions based on fear about how you move forward. I mean, that's a whole different discussion, yeah, the corporate side. We, we don't want to make decisions based on fear. Now, what you describe is so humanistic. I mean, it's so real what you described. There are four personality types when it comes to dealing with a crisis. The first one, we call it the victim. And the victim is like, why is this happening to me? You know, it's all about me. Why poor me, basically? And they get depressed and they feel terrible and down on themselves. The second group is the critic. Now, the critic no matter what the federal, state, or local government say, or the World Health Organization, or even the UN, they criticize everything. For example, Trish, you should wear a mask when you go outside. Well, that's stupid. Okay, Trish, don't wear a mask when you go outside. Well, that's stupid too. <laughs> like, no matter what you say, they criticize everything. Then you get to the third group, which we like to call the bystander. Now, mind you, the bystander is a good person. Okay, think about uh, the deer or the headlights look. They're completely overwhelmed by all these changes and they don't know what to do. So they look at their neighbors, they look to the left, they look to the right, and basically they're immobilized by fear and they do nothing. And this is what the, the first, these three groups have in common is they offer no solutions. And then we get to the fourth group and the fourth group we call the navigator. And the navigator, which is the whole basis of this book, starts off with great self-care, they take care of themselves, they have a positive attitude, they prepare themselves, they take initiative, they move into action, they're aware. Um, 
they're flexible because flexibility is a huge thing. If you think you can do things business as usual as you did before, you're going to fail flat out. We must be flexible and adaptable in our approach to this. And then, of course, as a result of that, they also help other people, which is the key number seven, which is kindness and compassion towards others. And, and so the goal, of course, is for all of us to become navigators. Now, having said that, all four of these personality types exist within each human being, in, exist within me, you, and everybody else listening. So none of you think I'm a hypocrite. When, when this thing hit, all my speaking engagements disappeared overnight, poof, gone. And I became, I was like the bystander, like, now what do I do? And I, and I, and I was the victim too. I'm like, what's going to happen to me now? Like all these things that I had planned for the summer, I had all these trips to do, gone. And have I been critical of certain things from the government or uh, you're darn right I have. However, the key is not to stay stuck there. So if you're going to be a victim, be a victim for an hour or two and then become a navigator or be critical of something. And sometimes the criticism are, are warranted. But you don't want to stay critical because that robs you of your own happiness and your wellness if you're in a critical negative state. So shift into navigator mode. And the same thing with the bystander. So the product of the book, Seven Kids Navigating Crisis, is a product of this process. Initially victim, a little critical and bystander. But then I picked up the phone. I called my good friend and we navigated and created a book in 45 days that now has helped thousands of people already. And we're just getting started, honestly. Yeah. So be yeah. a navigator, it's not like you're not going to have those and they may come back. I'm not saying I'm not going to be a victim tomorrow. If something happens that throws me or I get triggered, but I'm not going to stay there. Does that make sense? One thousand percent. What's is there a number one mistake that people make when they're trying to be a navigator or that keeps them being a victim or a bystander? I think awareness is the key. Like you have to be aware, what state am I in today? And we need to ask ourselves every day. You say you come home after a long day's work and you feel like down and depressed and so on. Well, the next day when you get up, what will be your approach to your day? And we need to make conscious decisions, live a mindful life, like choose. I'm gonna choose my reactions to events. There's so many events out of our control. We close the economy, we shut everything down. People like don't know what to do. We open up, shut it down again. We may open it up again and shut it. I mean, these are beyond my control. I don't control what the federal, state, or local government does. But I do control, however, is my attitude towards these things. So my work has shifted. I do most of my work through Zoom, LinkedIn, on the phone, Skype. That's how. So I've had to make adjustments myself because I can't see my clients. You have to adapt. It's so but, but that's not, but being flexible is actually a good thing for us. Right. It, and when it comes to flexibility, you know, we like to use the analogy of the oak tree and the palm tree. The oak tree, massive oak trees, especially in the South, huge. I mean, they've been there for a hundred years. If there's enough rain and moisture and enough wind, what happens to oak trees? Um, they come crashing down on cars, people right. and homes, right? Right. On the flip side, a palm tree at the peak of the hurricane, it will bend like parallel to the ground, completely parallel to the ground. But when the storm passes, and this is symbolic of life storms, guess what happens? It rises up again. So we're asking you to be palm trees, not oak trees. Oak trees are beautiful, but if you're inflexible, you're going to break. So right. be a, be, a palm tree. be flexible in life. Be flexible with your work. Be flexible with the people around you. Um, do you think happiness is a choice? A hundred percent. That's actually my motto. Happiness is a choice. Absolutely. But it takes work. Okay. I think for some people, uh, they have a certain predisposition. It, it may come easier in, than others. But if you do the things, that's why this book has been successful, The Seven Paths to Lasting Happiness. And the key was lasting happiness, not some kind of superficial, let me feel better for, for a little while. Lasting and transformative happiness, you got to do the work. There are no shortcuts. I've heard from a lot. I'm, I'm a very happy person. Try to be as much as possible, very positive. And then you do have those days, right, where... You just don't want to be happy. You just want to be a little, a little down in the dumps, and just let me do that. Um, but then, you, then I find people are like, "What's wrong with you? What's going on? What's going on with you? Why are you so sad today?" Because they expect that, that positive, joyful nature all the time. But that's not realistic, though. No, not at all. It's not realistic. I think, and, and we also need to differentiate between pleasure. Happiness and joy, because I think those those three things are, are a little bit differently. Um, life is all about expectations. 
So the greater the gap between expectations and reality, the greater the pain, the tears, the suffering, the depression, so on. When reality meets your expectations, that equals happiness. And then, you know, once in a while, Trish, reality exceeds your expectations. Like a, like a sunset in Maui or in Santorini in Greece or the birth of your first child or whatever. Those are joyful moments and those are to be treasured. They happen in life, but they don't happen all the time. So we, it's, it's all about managing expectations. So with COVID, I've had to manage my own expectations. Am I going to go to Europe and, and make those uh, speaking? No, I've already done some of them through a virtual webinar. Is it the same? Of course, it's not the same, but you still get the message out and you still bless people's lives. You know, I have a, an invitation to speak in Barcelona in, in, in uh, October. I definitely want to go to Barcelona. I don't want to do it through my computer. <laughs> right. But I don't control that. So all I can do is like, I'll do my best. If we'll wait, we have to wait and see what happens. Exactly. Um, the the first key in navigating a crisis, and I'm not gonna obviously give all these away because I, I think people should absolutely read the book. The first key though is that self, self-care. Yes. Is it number one because you think it is number one? Is that the most important thing we can do right this very second? Yes, and, and it's not an optional thing. In other words, and I'll give you an example of how the, the this pandemic has actually can be beneficial. I used to walk, uh, you know, one hour, uh, three days a week. That was like my exercise. You know, I'm not a gym rat. I just like to walk and outside. We live in Colorado, beautiful, you know, trees, lakes, and so on. During the pandemic, because my stress level went up just like everybody else, now I'm walking one hour every single day. Mm-hmm. Before I used to do it because it was, a, I have to do this for my health. You're getting older, you got to get out there. Now I'm doing it because I want to, and I have created a new habit. This is part of my self-care, and I'm going to keep this habit after the pandemic ends. I will walk every day for an hour, every single day, for the rest of my life. I create a new habit because I realized as the stress level goes up, my self-care needs to go up. I can't stay to the same level I was before because I'm going to suffer if I do. So I almost feel like I don't have a choice. But when you do something that you want to do out of your heart, it's not even a, it's not on a have to anymore. It's, I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. And that's also true. So in the book itself, I created a, uh, a, a, a personal health inventory or assessment. Uh, basically, 25, uh, I think it's 25, 25 questions, yes. Fi- physical health, emotional health, mental health, and spiritual health just for the reader to see where am I at right now today? And, you know, this assessment will show you maybe you have some strengths. Maybe in some areas you're doing really well, but struggling with some other ones. You read the book, you do the exercises, and you can retake the assessment at the end, and, and hopefully the score will be different. Maybe at the beginning you got 52, now I'm up to 85. It, as a way to measure how well I'm doing with my self-care. And that's early on in the book on purpose. That's why self-care is first. Okay. What are you hearing from people? What kind of feedback are you getting from folks who are reading this book? They, <laughs> I, I had a, uh, this morning, we did a, a pre-call. I, I'm doing a training um, for 700 people next Tuesday for Bank of America in New York. So I, I spoke with a lady that invited me to do this. And uh, she goes, you know what? I've read both of your books, but I really like the second one. I'm like, how come? Because I'm, I'm proud of my happiness book. That's the one that hit number one. She goes, because I have ADD. And it's only 100 pages, and I was done in two hours. <laughs> it's, and, it's just goes, and it's a practical guide. Like, anybody can do this. And this was the, this is actually consciously and thought, we were very thoughtful about, we want the book to get it out quickly, that people can read it, open up any page, and get something out of it as we're going through this pandemic. Not, that's why I said, not in 2021 or five years from now, right now with this crisis. Right. So I think that, that's what I'm hearing. People love the fact that it's easy to read, fast to read, and we, they can implement the things we're asking them to do, to be happier and to navigate more successfully. And I Like think, I said, if you're 18 years old or 48 or 88, you, you're going to get something out of it. For sure. And I also think people, too, for the last few months, we have been scrambling to find something like this where we can go, okay, I... I'm feeling really wonky. I need to get back on track and I don't know how to do that. So I think a lot of people are just scrambling right now to find something to kind of help our mental health and keep us going forward. Exactly. And and not only, I mean, initially we wrote this for individual, right? For everybody. But as it turns out, now companies are wanting us, both the, my partner and I, 
to come in and help them with their employees as they begin to open up again in the economy. And you know what they're asking uh, the most? The, the number one HR challenge right now, there's five of them, but the number one is ensuring the mental and physical well-being of the employees. Number one. And that comes out, out of a, an organization of 15,000 HR executives. So this is not just one person's opinion. Uh, the second one is like maintaining employee engagement, productivity, and effectiveness, which is tied into the first one. Sure. And then the next one is, you know, how to work from home, you know, this new normal of work from home life kind of balance. How does that work? And so on. So organizations and companies are asking us to come in and help them. What we call, you know, how you, when you're a new employee, you're onboarded to a new company, right? Mm -hmm. Well, now we're re-onboarding existing employees to this new normal. These are people that may have worked in your company for 5, 10, 20 years, but it's a new environment altogether. Yeah, it's like the first day of school. So it's like the first day of school, but the school looks really weird. <laughs> looks, people are wearing masks, so it looks weird. So they're hiring us to come in and help them to do that. I mean, that's what, you know, Bank of America is doing, that I'm doing with them next week and, and other companies. It's, it's kind of exciting because initially we wrote it for individuals. We didn't expect the corporate side. And my and so anyway, that's been kind of a, a, a nice thing, I guess. Well, and you're helping too. I mean, it's really nice to see that these companies are having employees come back or they're figuring out how they're moving forward in this pandemic. So it's nice to know that you guys will be out there helping those big companies. So we don't have employees who on that first week back to work are, are flipping out at work and just saying, I can't do this, it's too stressful. Well, employees are traumatized already. Yeah. And and I think between you and I, I'm not I'm not naming any any company specifically, but there are several many people that will not come back to work physically until 2021. They will refuse to come back to work because they don't feel safe until there's a vaccine out there. So that's one issue, which is not a bad thing because I think the productivity level, even working from home, hasn't dipped. People are doing okay working from home. It, it creates other issues. The other issue, of course, is people that do come back to work now, first meeting that you have, right? Leadership meeting, whatever. In a room that used to hold 100 people, now you only have 40 right? because of social distancing. Half the people are wearing masks. The other half are not. Now you have a bigger problem. The people wearing masks are like, well, I feel like you're jeopardizing my health by being in the same room and not wearing a mask. You, you're, you're not being you know, a team player. The people that are not wearing masks are saying, well, this is America. Don't tell me what to do. I'm healthy, I'm not coughing on you, so I'm not worrying him. So we have this interesting dilemma right now. How do we navigate so everybody can feel comfortable? It's, it's not an easy answer, I'm not saying I have the, but this is what we come in and help people navigate those. Uh, the main thing is don't make corporate decisions or big decisions based on fear that will impact the entire enterprise because that could be counterproductive. Exactly. Danger, yeah. yes, remember danger is real, fear is not your friend. Fear is paralyzing. It is paralyzing, yes. yes. I learned that from Dr. Gregoris. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Where can people find your book? Amazon. Uh, both of the books are on Amazon. Seven Keys to Navigating a Crisis and Seven Paths to Lasting Happiness. And I wanted to ask you about your good buddy, Coach Khan. What is his background? It, uh, Coach Khan is, has uh, no PhD, no psychology, all corporate. He's fantastic. He, he he just worked for companies. And he's a change management expert. So companies bring him in to help them change their, their culture, in essence. He's project management. He's fantastic. He, you, he's, all, he's all corporate. You and guys are like the corporate. dream team then. Well, thank you. <laughs> a, couple of, a couple of Greeks coming in and, and making everybody tip-top shape and super happy. That's, that's the uh, that's the idea. That's the goal. And we're happy to do it. Like, this is something that, yes, obviously, we all want to make money and we want the books to sell well and all that stuff. But truly, what motivates me and what has from the get-go is to make a difference in people's lives and, and, and in organizations' lives, because then you're talking about a lot more people, depending on the the size of the organization. So that part is exciting. Um, I feel like this is kind of an obvious question, but I want to hear what you say. If If I'm ultimately a happier person then I can be a better human every single day to others. Is that is that the my, goal of, of happiness? My my one of my quotes from my first book is that the world is a happier is a better place when the happier version of you is walking around. Think about that. Because I can bring that happiness home 
to my work, to my colleagues, to my family, people that I love, to my community. So, and, and Aristotle said it best. He said, happiness is the whole aim and meaning of human existence, the whole purpose of life. I mean, that's it. This is, the, this is why we're here on this earth. And as we are happy, we can elevate other people, which is the reason why both kindness and being of service is the last path or the last key to both of these books is this. When I promise you, no matter how tough you might have it, there's somebody in your community, maybe even in your own home, in your neighborhood, in your city or town, in this country or in the world, that's worse off than you are. Yeah. I guarantee it. So therefore, I feel like it's our responsibility to to help people out. And I've had people ask me, well, I'm really going through a hard time. Am I my brother's keeper? I'm like, uh, no, you're not your brother's keeper. You're your sister's keeper and your daughter's keeper and your mother's keeper and your cousin's and the homeless person down the street and somebody that lives half 10,000 miles away from you because we're all connected, we're all brothers and sisters. And I believe that kindness and happiness are interconnected. Happy people by nature go out and perform acts of kindness because their, their batteries are full. On the flip side, when people perform acts of service, they tend to be happier innately. That makes them happier. So I think you can't have one without the other. That's how I see happiness and kindness are like connected like this. Yeah, no, I, I agree 1000%. And I think those acts of kindness just come naturally. You don't really even think about them. You know, someone may say, well, that was very kind of you. And you just kind of go, oh, I'm, I'm just doing my thing. I don't know. I do know to tell you one thing, you have great energy. <laughs> I have a lot of energy. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean that, you know, like I said, technology, I don't know anything, but I can read people like an x-ray and I've been uh, watching you for the last 45 minutes. I, I seriously, I read people. That's, it's a gift. I can't, you know, I, I don't know how it happens. You have great energy. Well, thank you. Positive, positive energy, happy energy, dynamic. You're a dynamic lady. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. You know, I interviewed um, one of my old professors just a few weeks ago and he said something that he's been saying to me when I was in college for four years that I've known them, uh, he said, positive energy begets positive energy. And that's just how he rolls. And it has become my daily mantra. I just feel like if, if, I, if I just exude positive energy and if I can be positive in even negative situations, then positive energy is just gonna come back. And I think we feed off one another. I think this has been a very energetic uh, I love interview. It. I've enjoyed it, love it, love it. Well, I think you have to be, I mean, I think you have incredible energy as well, but you, you have to, right? Because you essentially are helping people navigate how, how to be happy. And so if you come in as, you know, dumpy doc, I mean, that's not going to do anything. <laughs> but, you know, but, but I also own the fact that, yes, have I been a victim? I told you, like I shared with you, victim or bystander or even critical. Yes. Yeah. I just didn't stay there. That's the key. Don't stay there for too long. An hour is enough. Give yourself permission to do that for an hour and then become a navigator with a positive attitude and go about your day and make a difference in somebody else's life. I, I agree so much. But yeah, and you know, you, you, you choose happiness just like you choose sadness, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yep. Well, happiness we're, we're going to wrap up a little bit because I want to get to the final three, which I, be okay. I believe, were you prepped? I hope so. No? Okay. Okay. Yeah. I There'll be a surprise then. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is, I'm really excited to hear this one. Best advice you've ever been given. Best advice I've ever been given came actually from my grandpa, whose name I carry, Ilya, when I was five years old, and he died soon after that. So I, that's the last memory I have of him. He said, you know, grandson, if you want to be happy in life, listen to this, five years old, do something good for somebody else every single day of your life, and you'll, have, you'll live a great life. And that, imagine what that did to a five-year-old boy, because I still remember it, and I've lived that. Like, yeah. I took that in. It, it, somehow, it made sense to my little brain back then. I'm like, well, that makes sense. Do something good for somebody else every day. You'd be happy. Simple. And I've been practicing that for half a century, really. And look at where you are now. I love the fact that you have people in your life who have just put these little nuggets or I don't know, big nuggets of wisdom with you. And that's where you are now, your mom, your grandpa. I just love that. I mean, yeah, I'm very grateful to them. You know, my, the, the last words my mom uh, said to me before she passed away, she goes, you know what? Don't worry about me. I'm going to be fine. I just want you to be happy. Those are the last words that I heard from her. So that has resonated with me for like, I know it's kind of a, uh, but it's beautiful though. 
I don't want to cry on your show, but it, it's really, it has, it changed my life. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure. I, and I, I bet she's just like super proud of you right now. I hope so. I think so. That's yeah. amazing. I love that. That's great advice. Um, Elia, what's your happy place? My happy place is my Greek home in uh, the town of Galax City. Um, you know, because I swim, I eat fresh fish. They, they caught them just a day. I connect with people that I've known for decades. We love, we laugh. And uh, you almost get to feel like I've, I have no stress when I'm there. I can't, I can't explain it. It, it's uh, that's why I go back every summer because it feeds my soul, and then I come back to the U.S. and kick ass. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can say that. Oops. Uh, no, I love it. That's great. That's <laughs> you have to have those recharge moments so you can come back and do good for other people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Final meal, final drink. What would that look yeah, like? I, I really struggle with it because I don't really drink alcohol, so I don't know what my my drink it would can be. be anything. Milkshake. If it's a milk, a chocolate milkshake, that'd be my my final. I love chocolate milkshake. Perfect. And meal? What and, would your uh, meal look like? You know, the meal would be probably some Greek lamb. You know, that would be good. Some just like juicy lamb or you know something like that. Yeah, it'd be good. Mm. That is on my, you, my bucket list. You ask that I'm very curious. Why do you ask that question? That's an interesting question. Um, I'm a foodie. I I love 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 food and uh here in southern oregon we're kind of right smack dab in the middle of wine country so i'm a bit of a wino also i love <laughs> in a good way in a healthy i have a healthy obsession with food and drink um but i just love i think you can tell a lot about a person uh based on their final meal or, or like their favorite meal because that's really what it is it's your favorite meal um but yeah, I just, I love to hear what other people would eat if they couldn't have any other meals after that. Well, if, if you're a foodie, I'm sure people who are in the culinary arts right now are going, what is he talking about? Like <laughs> Greek lamb with milkshake. But those are my two cultures, right? I'm Greek and then I'm American. So those, they, they, they kind of define me in some ways. And by the way, we love Southern Oregon. We've been up there at least 15 times in our in our lifetime. There's a there's a beautiful little town called Ashland. Yes, I know it well. Very well. We come up for the Shakespeare Festival. Yeah. Probably every other year, and we love you know flying to Medford and then drive 15 minutes to Ashland. We don't even rent a car. We walk everywhere. Love Southern Oregon. Beautiful. Oh my beautiful. gosh. Beautiful. You just made my day. And if you ever come back to Southern Oregon, you better look me up because I'll take you guys to a winery. Okay, and where are you in Southern, like what part of Southern I'm Oregon in Medford. are you at? In Medford. Oh, you're in Medford? Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, my gosh, I've been there so many times. Wow. Yeah. I no, it's, it's beautiful country. That's why I came here and 18 years later, I haven't left. I just love it so much. It's beautiful. For those of you listening in, see, I know she's bragging about her place like <laughs> I brag about mine, but it's totally true. Medford, Ashland, that whole area is gorgeous. It is. It is absolutely gorgeous. And I hope, I hope once things settle down, we can get back back to business here in Southern Oregon, just like every other place in the country. And I will take you up on that because we will come back again. We just have to wait and see what, not this fall, but maybe next fall we'll come back again for okay. sure. Okay, well, I'm gonna hold you to it. So I'm gonna take you to some of my favorite wineries around here. Sounds great. Um, you've been so much fun and so, um, I have so much to think about after this interview. And I hope those who are listening also have a lot to think about and um, get the book. Get the book and start navigating through this crisis and be a better human. And remember, what really matters in the end is what you do with what you learn. That's all that, you know, do something different to improve your life and bless your life and those, those around you. And you'll be happy doing that. Okay. One more That's time. The book is Seven Keys to Navigating a Crisis, A Practical Guide to Emotionally Dealing with Pandemics and Other Disasters. And you can find it on Amazon. Um, if you are listening to this podcast on Apple or Spotify, please subscribe, rate, and review. You can also watch this at ktvl.com or just look me up on YouTube. That's uh, Off Script with Trish Glos. One more time, Dr. Elia Gorgoris, thank you so much for being here and sharing your brain with us. It's been an honor. It's been my pleasure. And you're just a fantastic interviewer because you bring so much energy to, to this. This was a, like a walk in the park with you. It was great. Oh, biggest compliment ever.